Hi everyone, good afternoon, good morning, good evening from wherever you are joining from. Uh, welcome to, believe it or not, our 10th edition of Inside Talk. Thank you so much for taking the time today to join. Uh, my name is Dustin Smith. I work here on the uh, marketing team at Tauk. Um, for those of you who haven't joined us before for an Inside Talk session, welcome. And for those of you who have, welcome back. Uh, this platform is something we created back in the spring to stay engaged with you all, our guests, to stay engaged with our Tauk directors, to stay engaged with our great partners like Serena, who you'll be hearing from today uh, during a, this unfortunate time of a travel pause. And it's a way for us to showcase Tauk, showcase our partners, and showcase the expertise and knowledge that we bring to the travel world. And we hope it provides you with a little bit of knowledge, a little bit of inspiration and uh, a little bit of excitement uh, to travel again as soon as we can when it's safe to do so. So before we get to Serena, just a couple housekeeping items. You are all on mute. You are on Zoom webinar with us today. You're on mute so that there's no background noise and Serena can, can speak freely. Uh, we will hopefully have some time for a Q&A at the end of the session, although Serena does have a pretty robust talk with you today. So she may go a little bit longer than an hour. If we don't get to the Q&A, I will save the chats and Serena has um, graciously assisted us with um, answering those questions for you after the presentation we will send them back out to you. So if you do have questions, please write them into the chat and I will monitor those throughout. I'll answer what I can, probably not too many because Serena is the expert. Um, one last thing, there is a closed captioning provided today live. If you do not want to have closed captioning, you can just go to the bottom of your screen and toggle it off. It's called closed captioning and then you would show subtitle or do not show subtitle. Um, I believe that's it. So without any further ado, I will uh, mute myself and remove my screen and I will introduce you to Serena Spinelli, who is one of our great partners in Milan, Italy, and she will be talking to you today about the Ambrosiana collection. So Serena, take it away. Good afternoon, Dustin. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for inviting me to spin my art historical tales today. I am speaking to you from Milan, and this is the Italian metropolis well known to the world at large for the fashion industry, the design industry, and for a very hardworking mentality. But I'm here to tell you today that it is not just a trendy modern city. It is also a city with an ancient history. Milan, too, is home to some of the most unexpected historical cultural treasures and sophisticated nooks of beauty that this complex and fascinating country has to offer. So during the lockdown, all of Milan's treasures seemed to be enchanted. A cruel spell had been cast upon us, and all the museums looked silent and congealed in time. But even though the lights were low and systems appeared to be down, we could imagine that the Renaissance Madonnas and the Baroque noblemen in the picture galleries would still relate to each other in subtle ways, could still tell each other stories from one gilded frame to the other, or whisper their colorful secrets from one crystal case to the next. So a new way of appreciating art had to be found and it is in this spirit that I began focusing on a few of these artifacts at a time. From afar, of course, but with more imagination than before. Milan has many wondrous collections, but one of my favorites is undoubtedly the Ambrosiana. Now, it's a great treasure chest of knowledge and beauty, in the center of Milan. It rests upon a small, solemn piazza of stone, not too far from the Duomo, which if you've visited Milan, you will know is the great Gothic cathedral, which is one of the symbols of the city. But the Ambrosiana is tucked away from the crowds and most of the commercial venues. 
Now, normally, of course, we would enter from the front door of the Ambrosiana. We would walk up the steps, push past two heavy glass and wooden doors. We would walk down a great marble hall bedecked with the casts of the Trojan column. We would approach the man behind the mahogany cubicle about the price of the ticket, and then we would glide up another flight of steps, inhabited by a series of sculptures, paintings, even bronze trees, and the mind would prepare itself for the experience, and thus the traditional journey would begin. But we today are incorporeal in this particular experience and we are like spirits in all of this so we can do as we please amongst the enchanted museums so i'm going to invite you to hover above the roofs of the city for a while with me and then dive into the heart of this institution from above as you can see from this first slide now, this is one of the secret courtyards of the Ambrosiana. It's a space of great beauty, great silence, which has evolved naturally through the ages from the architectural toil of men. And this is a place really where many, many stories come together. You can just about catch a glimpse on the right hand side there of a classical building with rows of rounded um, arches and lodges. Now beyond those lodges, you have to imagine that there are mosaic rooms and marble halls that await you, where statues, goddesses, ivory caskets can converse with the feathered vests of a shaman and the natural trinkets of a chamber of wonders, such as the eclecticism of this particular collection. On the left-hand side of that slide, you can also take a peek at the apse, the brick apse of a medieval church. This is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And it was built by the Milanese Knights in the 11th century as they returned from the First Crusades. And this is where ancient echoes and the ancient sands of Jerusalem mingle together. Now in the middle of all of this is the courtyard that you see and it's called the courtyard of the great souls. And here we are bound to find a bronze shoulder to perch on. Will it be Thomas Aquinas? Will it be Shakespeare? Manzoni? Stendhal? Plato? Paracelsus? even the Polish revolutionary Potofi. Now the idea of gathering all these great characters together in one place comes from Dante's Divine Comedy and specifically from one chapter called The Inferno where Virgil accompanies Dante through the author's personal vision of limbo where he imagines that the great souls of great pagans dwell, so the non-believers, who nonetheless had, le had led lives of moral virtue and intellectual accomplishment. But this bronze rendition of the comedy which you see here in the courtyard also features Christians like St. Thomas Aquinas. And so ultimately is the manifestation of the founder of the Ambrosiana, Cardinal Federico Borromeo. And his most important motto in life was credere and comprendere, which means to believe and to understand. So the two must go hand in hand. Now the Cardinal came, you can see a portrait of him, on the left-hand side here, he came from a noble Milanese family, the Borromeo, and he had previously been also the patron of the famous Academy of St. Luke in Rome. But when he conceives of the Ambrosiana, 
he is already Archbishop of Milan. We are talking about the late 16th century, very, very beginning of the 17th century. And he has just succeeded his famous cousin, St. Charles Borromeo, uh, in this role. Now, Federico was a man of letters. He was not just a religious man, but he was also a humanist. He had a humanist perspective, certainly. And he encouraged critical thinking um, and education. And this did not diminish, however, the strength of his spiritual faith. Such was the enlightenment that he had received by the high Renaissance culture. Now, this historical stronghold of wisdom and beauty, which he shall build at the beginning of the 17th century in Milan, will be conceived as a place of study and learning and comprised a picture gallery with all of his prized possessions, an academy, an academy of the arts where aspiring sculptors, painters, and draftsmen could learn from these collections and a center of research. But this is also where he will build a library like no other. So the Ambrosiana is a gallery, but also a library, a very ancient library. And it has a great historical significance. The Ambrosiana library was not conceived exclusively for uh, princes and prelates, but it was open to men and women of all walks of life, just as long as they could read, of course, but without any class distinction. So it's an incredibly important library, one of the first public libraries, and the only precedent really in Europe at this time is the uh, Oxford University Library in England. Now, when Federico Borromeo inaugurated this library, you, you can see in the slide now the ancient reading room, um, he inaugurated it on the 8th of December, which is the day of our patron saint in Milan, Saint Ambrose, thus the name Ambrosiana. He dedicated it to the patron saint. And the library opens in 1609, and the guests are ushered into this sumptuous space with high vaulted ceilings, colorful gilded vaults, high about 15 meters from the ground. And today, as you can see, visitors still find themselves embraced by this wonderful Baroque cabinetry, where at the time, 15,000 manuscripts and more than 30,000 codexes from all over the world basically were the riches at one's fingertips. Now today, of course, the holdings of this library have more than quadrupled. Now the texts which had been collected were written in many different languages, in Greek, in Latin, in the Vulgate Italian, in Persian, in the golden tongues of knowledge. And they covered a wide cornucopia of subject matter from astronomy to theology, from judicial matters to love affairs, from classical literature to mathematics. And the reading material was carefully catalogued and made suitable for consultation. And this was very modern, a very modern approach for 1608. The bookshelves that you see, in fact, allowed for a more liberal browsing of the codexes, as opposed to the older monastic libraries where books were actually chained to the desks and you couldn't pick and choose, you just had to read what was available on the day. Now the Cardinal, Federico Borromeo, also made sure that anyone visiting the library uh, had access to ink, to paper, to a well-lit fire in the winter. Now, for the vastness of its collections, the Ambrosiana is undoubtedly one of the most important libraries in the world. And for the purposes of this narration, and in general, I will consider this old antique library 
as one of the great works of art. The first work, which will I, I will introduce today, and from which three main other works uh, will spring forth in various ramified ways. Now, amongst the most outstanding manuscripts, which we can find here, carefully protected within the safe, the caveau of the Ambrosiana beneath the building, is what you see on the screen now, which is called the Ilias Picta. And it's the only illustrated Iliad which has come down to us from the antique world. And so in this parchment is where the Athenian soldiers of the Iliad do battle in their clashing armor, body to body, color to color, on this millinery parchment, 5th century AD, from Alexandria, most probably. And it was probably the product of many different artists. Now, another wonderful piece in the Ambrosiana collection in the library is this here, which is referred to as a manuscript called Of Divine Proportion. Now, such is the title of this amazing 15th century manuscript. It's a compendium of different complex geometric shapes, as you can see. Um, shapes, shapes which had been originally discussed in the antique world by Euclid, and which are here um, discussed and explained by the mathematician, the 15th century mathematician called Luca Pacioli, who's actually a Franciscan monk, who was at the court of the Sforzas. The Sforzas were the absolute rulers of Milan in the 15th century, and they had quite an enlightened court. And Fra Luca Pacioli um, is therefore the author of this piece, but one of his brightest pupils was none other than Leonardo da Vinci. And we know that Leonardo has spent more than 20 years of his life and career in Milan. And indeed, this particular codex, all the watercolors, the, 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 the sketches, the drawings, the wonderful uh, imagery that you see, is Leonardo's work. So he illustrated the manuscript, and these are jewels of symmetry, crystals of numbers, forests of facades and kaleidoscopes of planes, as you can see, all elements of this symbiosis between the aesthetic beauty of architecture and of the human body, seen through the eyes, of course, of 15th century humanists and seen through the perspective of geometry. Now, Leonardo is widely appreciated uh, uh, it is widely appreciated, had numerous interests uh, and curiosities. And the Ambrosiana collection treasures the largest and most eclectic collection in the world of original drawings, sketches, notes, thoughts, doodles, and formulas by the universal man. And this codex, which contains over 1,200 separate folios, is known all over the world as the Codex Atlanticus, and it is kept within the Ambrosiana Library. And this codex embraces about 40 years of Leonardo's uh, career and of his life, from 1478 to the year of his death, 1519. And it expresses everything from mathematics to mechanical engineering, uh, from botany to astronomy, from town planning to scenography. And within it, we may see experiments and projects for the exploration uh, and the depths of the oceans or for the scrutiny of the skies. No other artist from the Renaissance has left us such a large cultural legacy, such an important number of documents, in fact, uh, by which it is possible to follow his train of thought, uh, to follow the evolution 
of his preoccupations. And these documents, I'm showing you some of them now, um, in fact, all of the Da Vinci codexes, not just the Codice Atlantico, including, including those in the international collections, all of these notes have had a rather checkered history. And I'm going to try and summarize that for you now. So everything begins in 1519, a few days before Leonardo da Vinci's death, when Leonardo was in France at the court of Francis I. He was in Amboise. And just before he dies, he bequeaths all of his materials, his paintings, his instruments, his notes, his codexes, to his faithful disciple, Francesco Melzi. And Francesco Melzi was a Lombard painter from Milan, who was living uh, together with, with Leonardo in France at the time. Now, when Leonardo dies, therefore, the materials are transferred to Melzi's villa in Vaprio d'Adda, just outside of Milan. And here, unfortunately, after Melzi's death, his heirs allow its dispersal. They did not know, that they didn't realize how important these documents were, or they didn't care for them. And they began to sell sheets of parchment indiscriminately. Now, subsequently, in the late 16th century, the sculptor, uh, Pompeo Leone, he was a sculptor, but he was also an antiquarian, and he was working for the Spanish governors at uh, in Milan at the time when Milan was under Spanish rule. We're talking about the second half of the 16th century. Pompeo Leoni heard about this dispersal and he began to buy back parts of these notes. He embarked on a campaign to recover as much of the lost material as possible. And indeed, he managed to preserve a great part of this heritage, but it is estimated that all the documents that we have all over the world by Leonardo da Vinci only represent a fourth of what actually uh, existed. Now, what did Pompeo Leone do at this point? What he did was he began to catalog all these folios, all these original documents. And to our dismay, perhaps, he began cutting and pasting and so he divided, basically, all, uh, all the different topics in two separate volumes. Now, the first volume containing all the naturalistic and anatomical drawings that he could find was taken to Spain, where it eventually found its way to England and is now referred to as the Windsor Codex. The second volume, on the other hand, where Pompeo Leone gathered, as you can see, all the technical and scientific notes and drawings, became the Codex Atlanticus, so-called because of its large format, uh, much like that of an atlas, Atlante, Atlantico. And in the 17th century, the codex was purchased by a Milanese nobleman called Marquis Galeazzo Arconati of Milan. And he donated the, the codex, this wonderful piece of, of incredible uh, original documents, to the Ambrosiana in 1637. And it has been there ever since. Now, of course, the story is a little more rocambolesque and a little more full of trials and tribulations than I have told you, including Napoleon's requisitions at the end of the 18th century. But suffice it to say that the Codex Atlanticus has always made it back to the Ambrosiana, where it still is lovingly curated and exhibited today. About 20 folios every three months are exhibited in the old reading room of the Ambrosiana. And every three months, there's a different topic, therefore, that you can see it's on rotational display. Now, his codexes are also 
the witness of Renaissance man's struggle to separate his work from that of a mere artisan. So he contributed greatly to the elevation of the artist's social and intellectual status. Now, a lot has been said about Leonardo's dilemmas, his pentimenti, his unfinished works, his indecisions. But what of his convictions? And in fact, the Codex Atlanticus is undeniable proof that Leonardo was profoundly convinced that science and art were interrelated and that you could not be a good scientist without drawing directly from nature and that conversely, you could not be a good artist without taking an interest in science. So he was convinced that the art of drawing had a princely role and that this was a supreme instrument by which we could know the universe, by which the universe could be studied and analyzed. And all of this research and thought, it's uncanny, but it's contained in mysterious ways within his paintings too. And the Ambrosiana is also the protector of a haunting example of his ideal portraiture. And this is what you have on the screen here. This is a piece called The Musician by Leonardo da Vinci, and the year is approximately 1485. Now, this particular portrait is believed to be of Franchino Gaffurio, a choir master of the Duomo, and a skilled musician working at the court of the Sforza, the court of Ludovico il Moro, Ludovico the Moor, as he was referred to. And this depiction, however, is very different from the typical Milanese portraiture of the time, which was usually in strict profile. The character here, painted by Leonardo, as you can see, is in a three-quarter position. So there is this will to turn around and face towards us, which is clearly evident. Now, Leonardo first arrived at the Milanese court in 1482, and he had been sent to Milan by Lorenzo de' Medici. So he came with a delegation from Florence in order to amuse the absolute ruler of Milan. And he came with a good friend of his, uh, the name is Atalante Migliorotti, who was also a musician. Now it has been postulated that this could be, in fact, a portrait of Migliorotti, not a portrait of Franchino Gaffurio, but in fact, if you look at what he holds in his hand, he holds a musical sheet, and we can just about make out a few words which refer to a piece called the Cantum Angelicum, which is actually a piece composed by Franchino Gaffurio. Now, Leonardo himself was a talented musician. Not many people know this, but he was endowed with a beautiful voice. And he was a sublime performer of the lira da braccio, which is sort of like the great grandfather of the violin. And he was also fond of inventing these very, very curious musical instruments. The most famous one is the viola organista, which is a fusion between a keyboard instrument and a chord instrument. And he was fascinated by the vibration of chords. And he often studied the differences between sound waves and light waves. And it is well known that Leonardo referred to music, to the art of music, as the painting of the invisible. So as if it could express, therefore, what painting could not. Now, the expression here in the face of Franchino Gaffurio, of this musician, is very, very intense, as you can see. And the bodily perception of the sitter and his psychological presence is emphasized by this dark background, which pushes the figure to the foreground, to the front, and almost makes it pop out of the frame. So the three dimensions 
are also further expressed by the use of chiaroscuro, what we call chiaroscuro, which is light and shade. And he had first learned this technique by looking at Flemish painting, but Leonardo develops uh, this technique to the most sophisticated heights, as you can see. And this painting is a very acute analysis of how light falls on a face, on the surface of the face, as you could possibly imagine. Now, he was very interested in human physiognomy, Leonardo, and he wanted his portraits to look real and individual. Um, his drawings and studies on the various human expressions, on the various characters and emotions are known uh, and well documented within the Ambrosiana, actually. Uh, in 1498, he also began to put together a treatise on the art of painting. And within it, he stresses the importance of being true to nature rather than to a particular canon of beauty invented by man. He also believed, and this is very important, uh, it's another one of his convictions, that in order to paint a good portrait, one must express the stirring of the soul, i moti dell'animo, we say in Italian. So this is what we see through the eyes of the sitter, of the musician. It's an inner movement. Let me see if I can enlarge this for you just slightly. There you are. And it's an inner movement. So it's a movement from within, from behind those eyes, which makes this factual external physiognomy come alive and it's a painting which expresses not only the surface therefore of the skin and bones but what goes on beyond the eyes so the eyes painted by leonardo um, also express a movement of another kind because they express the thoughts of the mind they express the fancies of the heart the flurries of the spirit so man in Leonardo's conception will be exposed at 360 degrees, weaknesses and strengths alike. And through Leonardo, the portrait, we can say, actually becomes man. So this concept, of course, you will guess, becomes paramount to Leonardo when it is time to paint The Last Supper which is also a wonderful work of art that we have here in Milan. Now, our own eyes and spirit are moved when we walk through the halls of the Ambrosiana. When we walk through the halls of the Ambrosiana, of the picture gallery, and we experience the shape of these wonderful halls, the, the space that the Cardinal built in 1618 and that his successors will enlarge, in fact, because the collection of the Ambrosiana will become larger and larger and larger as the centuries go by. Many noble Milanese, family, many Milanese families will, uh, in fact, bequeath their works of art to the Ambrosiana. Now, one such scintillating image, which you can see as you walk through the halls, is this mosaic wall at the bottom of this grand staircase there on the right-hand side. And this is a mosaic which reflects and represents another precious manuscript in the library, contained within the library, which you can see on the left-hand side. So you see there is this continuous relationship between the library and the gallery. Now the 14th century manuscript in question is Petrarch's, Francesco Petrarca's, beautifully executed copy, his own personal copy, of Virgil, Virgil's most famous poets, poems. And the frontispiece, which you see on the left-hand side there, is in the purest uh, international Gothic style. And it's a miniature composed by the Tuscan artist Simone 
da Martini. And he's also the author, Simone Martini, of very large works of large religious triptychs, large panel pieces commissioned for the churches and the societies of Siena. But here, he makes himself very small. He dotes on the particulars. Uh, he scales down his world and creates a miniature heaven in this manuscript where the characters from Virgil's stories come alive and interact with each other within this very bucolic landscape. Now, that which makes this manuscript so exciting and so precious, you can see in the center there, in the slide in the center. And it's the fact that Petrarch annotated, underlined, and created a series of notes there on the margins, in the margins of this manuscript. So apparently he took this manuscript wherever he went, and he used to jot down thoughts, events of his life, and lo and behold, to the excitement of many critics and many historians, he even adorns this manuscript, now in the Ambrosiana, with the obituary of his beloved Laura, the mysterious woman whom he loved from afar and whose beauty inspires more than 300 love sonnets. And Petrarch was supposed to have seen Laura for the very first time in Avignon in France at the Church of St. Clair. And there's a specific date, in fact, 6th of April, 1327. And he will love this woman from afar until her death. And her death is signaled within this manuscript. Now, earlier Italian poets had written splendid sonnets expressing their love for uh, particular women, but it's Petrarch's poems in the 14th century that give rise to a whole generation of translations and imitations in Europe, and especially in England, where his example will inspire great love sonnets like the ones of Spencer, like the ones of William Shakespeare. But there is another love story, an ancient love story, to be told within the walls of the Ambrosiana. And another curious, fetish-worthy object to be seen at the Ambrosiana, and it is this golden lock of hair which you see on the right hand side there. So you see amidst all of this knowledge in the Ambrosiana library lies a little packet of letters. The Ambrosiana library owns the sweet correspondence between the humanist Pietro Bembo and the most sublime Lucretia Borgia, who at the time was the Duchess of Ferrara. Now, and the lock, the lock of blonde hair was contained within one of these letters. So it's, it's a very sensual relic of their thwarted platonic or mostly platonic love. Now, Lord Byron, the English romantic poet, had read this correspondence when he visited the Ambrosiana on his grand tour. The Ambrosiana was quite an important stop on the grand tour back then. And it is known, in fact, and this is quite a funny anecdote, that Byron stole a single hair from this lock when the librarian of the Ambrosiana wasn't looking. And he carried it around with him always as a kind of precious memento. And this story got me thinking, what is in a lock of hair? What is the symbolism behind the lock of hair? When I look at this, I think of the fertile power that women's hair has always had within the imagination of many authors, whether they are sacred or profane. So I picture, for example, Mary Magdalene uh, and how she washed Christ's feet and delicately dried them 
with her silken hair, a mane of silken hair, which Titian here, Tiziano, imagines as this very luscious and luminous drapery covering the nude body of Mary Magdalene when she renounces all of her riches and all of her fine clothes in penance. And this is a painting by Titian that you can also see in the Ambrosiana. I am reminded also when I, look, when I think about that lock of hair of Erminia that you see on the left-hand side, this wonderful maiden from the Crusades and the dramatic cutting of her hair in order to bind the wounds of her beloved Tancredi in Torquato Tasso's Jerusalem Delivered, an epic poem written in the 16th century. So the hair there will have this very profound restorative power. And then last but not least, we have on the right-hand side, Walter Crane's Victorian illustration of Rapunzel and the strength of her long tresses, uh, the sweet ropes for a young lover to liberate her with, supposedly. So this lock of hair is a timeless relic of sensuality, femininity, strength, creativity. But briefly, who were Lucretia and Bimbo? Lucretia, of course, was Pope Alexander Borgia's infamous daughter. She has been depicted throughout history as a woman of extravagant vices, but really we must remember that she began her story as a child bride, married to three different husbands in dramatic succession and homicide, ruthlessly exploited for political advantage when she was very young by her father and her brother. And when the scholar and humanist Pietro Bembo, whom you see in this wonderful poetic portrait by Giorgione on the upper left-hand side there, when he meets her, when he first sets his eyes on her, she had just become the new Duchess of Ferrara, one of the most prestigious courts in Italy. And the cost had been very high for Lucretia Borgia, for her beloved second husband, Alfonso, the son of the King of Naples, had been murdered and she had been separated from her child to begin this new life as Alfonso d'Este's new bride in Ferrara. Now there are many images of Pietro Bembo and uh, Lucretia Borgia and the letters at the Ambrosiana are a record really of this passionate but gentle and covert love affair which lasted uh, about 16 years. Now the most well-known portraits or so-called portraits in fact of Lucretia Borgia uh, is of course the female sitter that you see in the center there painted by Bartolomeo Veneto, a Venetian painter, which Many in the past have supposed, uh, in fact, actually painted a portrait of Lucretia in real life. In reality, this would not have been possible. This would have been too scandalous, depicting the real Lucretia in this way. Though the eyes of the main portrait there in the center bear a similarity to the eyes in the verified portrait on the bottom right-hand side there, portrait by Dosso, whom you see a detail of. So Lucretia Borgia here is, or the supposed Lucretia Borgia, is dressed up as Flora, right, the goddess of spring. And it makes me think of another illustrious Flora present within the precincts of the Ambrosiana. Now she resides within a space in the Ambrosiana, which you see on the left-hand side there, called the Peristyle. In order to step into this space, all you have to do is draw the black velvet curtain that you see at the end of the old reading room. And you will find yourself in this very atmospheric antechamber. And when you will look down, you will see that there is an image of an antique flora 
embedded within the flooring of this little colonnaded room. And in fact, what you see is a fourth century AD mosaic. So as you can see, the, the Ambrosiana is a treasure chest of all of Milan's history. Now this mosaic was found in the 19th century in the area of the old Roman baths of Milan, a vestige therefore of the city's very prominent and ancient past as capital of the Roman Empire of the West. Now the Emperor Maxentius at the time had built 14,000 square meters of Roman baths in Milan. And Flora is probably, the, this lovely maiden here, is probably the most beautiful and precious fragment that has come down to us from this once sumptuous building. Now, the golden hair of Lucretia, however, to go back to her, may also be associated in my mind with a symbol of grace and purity, the blonde hair. With such qualities in mind, it adorns the head of a beautiful virgin by Botticelli. And here is, on your screen now, the very humble prima donna of another beautiful painting in the Cardinal, uh, Cardinal Borromeo's collection in the Ambrosiana. And this is the Madonna of the Red Pavilion. It's a very special piece by Botticelli. You can see her in all her glory now on your screen. And however, when we think of Botticelli, I think that surely one or two of his great masterpieces will come to mind. For example, The Birth of Venus or um, The Allegory of Spring. La Primavera. Now, these are all prevalently pagan themes, pagan iconographies, and very typical of Florentine humanism in the late 15th century. However, this piece that we have before us is very rare because although it's very beautiful and very enchanting for many reasons, it's very different from the kind of Botticelli themes that we have in mind. The subject, above all, is purely religious, as you can see. It was painted, we believe, between 1490 and 1495. And thus, it coincides and expresses the gathering intensity of Botticelli's religious fervor. So at this time, the artist underwent a personal religious crisis, a kind of moral dilemma. He had fallen under the influence of the infamous Savonarola, the Dominican monk who had come to Florence and who preached pauperism and a return to austerity, and who also foresaw a kind of apocalypse upon the Medici rule. Now Botticelli was so taken with Savonarola's speech and with his ideas, that it is thought, it is, we have been told, we have figured out from various letters and documents and by word of mouth, that he was so taken with Savonarola that he decided to be one of his followers and that he decided to burn many of his remaining pagan works in his workshop. So just think what, uh, what else could have been produced had he not had this religious crisis. And yet this painting is absolutely enchanting. Now, what he paints here is an image of the Maria Lactans, right? So this is a, a type of Virgin Mary who is getting ready to breastfeed the baby Jesus, as you can see. She has one breast uncovered. And it was a subject which reflected his newfound piety and which also reflected some of the themes that uh, you could have seen in the past in the international Gothic style of Northern Europe. And it's a theme which also became the object of a cult 
in Italy, it developed in the 14th century, uh, a cult around the breast milk of the Virgin Mary. Now the work is full of different Marian symbols of all kinds. She herself, as you can see, inhabits a wonderful garden, but she's within an enclosed low stone wall, which in the history of art we refer to as the Artus Conclusus, so an enclosed garden. It's an iconography which recurs constantly in the depiction of the Virgin Mary and which refers to her chastity. So she is separated from that romantic landscape beyond. She's privy to, to nature's abundance, but yet she is chaste, of course the birth of her child being the work of divine intervention. Now, in the foreground there, in that vase, that bronze vase at the bottom, you can see a lily, which is another symbol of her white purity. And yet the child, as you can see, he totters towards the mother's full and nurturing breast, and he's guided by an angel, very sweetly and delicately guided by this angel as two other angels on the sides draw the red curtains of this pavilion as if to reveal a scene to our eyes, as if this is a revelation. And the canopy over her head is in fact a very early uh, Paleo-Christian, early Christian iconography symbolizing the heavens. So in fact, the Virgin Mary here is also seen as the queen of the heavens. Now it's very difficult to see, but just above the canopy and just below that wonderful cornice, that wonderful gilded frame, you can see that it's decorated with oranges and green leaves and oranges were the Flemish equivalent of apples in the sense that they expressed the idea of original sin. And so there is this strange fusion in this wonderful piece between the physical and the ethereal. And uh, this is the Madonna of the Red Pavilion. This is the piece which attracts so many visitors to the Ambrosiana. It ensnares them within this suspended moment, which Botticelli artfully created here. Now, more than any other um, Renaissance master, perhaps more than any other Italian master, Botticelli knew what line could accomplish. Now, within the history of art, there's always been this dance between, this very lively, rhythmical dance between line and color. Painters who favored color as a means of expression, like the Venetians, and painters like the Florentines, who favored excellent draftsmanship and line. And Botticelli was one of these. He could accomplish these incredibly beautiful linear compositions. So these are full of subtlety and brilliance. If you allow your eyes to glide over that drapery, the drapery of the angels, the drapery that covers the angels' limbs, you will see and you will perceive that there is a kind of soft breeze blowing through the scene. But then at a certain point, everything is frozen in time. Everything is crystallized in time. So Botticelli is a, a magician of sorts. And just so you can give a face to the name, here is uh, a self-portrait of Botticelli. It's a detail from the Adoration of the Magi. Um, which is a piece which he painted for uh, the Church of Santa Maria Novella in Florence. So as you can see, he was quite beautiful himself. But there is yet another Marian symbol within this piece that we still haven't analyzed. And this is uh, the Book of Prayers, which you see on the stone ledge there in the detail. It's a manuscript which the Virgin obviously was reading quietly to herself before, before the baby was brought to her for feeding. And this is a symbol, usually, of the Virgin's 
wonderful wisdom. It's a symbol which marks her as a Christian equivalent of Athena, the goddess of wisdom and knowledge. And the book obviously brings me back to the subject of the library, if only momentarily. For the example painted by Botticelli actually appears to be what we call a book of hours. So it adds a contemporary 15th century note to this painting. And a book of hours was a private devotional aid containing prayers for the different canonical hours of the day. And it was usually richly illuminated and owned by persons of very high rank within Botticelli's time. And it so happens that the Ambrosiana Library cherishes such an example, which I'm showing you now. At least I'm showing you a page from this wonderful book of hours. And this is the Borromeo Book of Hours. So it was made as a wedding present um, in the late 15th century for one of the ladies of the Borromeo family. So one of the ancestors of the founder of the Ambrosiana, one of the ancestors of the Cardinal. Now it also, this page, brings us back to Leonardo because in fact, the author who illuminated, the artist who illuminated this wonderful manuscript is Cristoforo de Predis, who was one of Leonardo's Milanese disciples. And Milan was a very important center for manuscript illumination, as this wonderful piece testifies. Now, to my delight, the page that I was able to find is connected to the Virgin Mary, direct, directly connected to the Virgin Mary, in fact, because on the left-hand side there, you can see a very uh, wonderful little scene of the marriage of the Virgin Mary to Joseph in the temple in Jerusalem. So it's an apocryphal scene, an unofficial scene, which is a wonderful link to another beautiful painting by Raphael, which is in the Brera collection in Milan, and which the Milanese are very fond of. But all this talk of the hours, the book of hours, the hours of the day, the pages of the book, it guides my mind towards the theme of transience. Uh, time unfolds, and nature and life have their cycles. And this guides my memory to one of the icons of the Ambrosiana Gallery. And this will be my parting gift to you. This is the marvelous, the marvelous still life of, uh, by a painter whose life was anything but still. And this painter is Caravaggio. Now, uh, this piece has been in the personal collection of Cardinal Federico Borromeo since 1607, so since he began this cultural enterprise. And we know that he acquired it uh, during one of his trips to Rome. And it's possible that he actually knew Caravaggio very well, that he knew him personally, and probably uh, they had a common friend. Uh, the very famous Cardinal del Monte of Rome, who was one of uh, Caravaggio's first patrons. Now, Borromeo will always treasure this piece, this basket of fruit, which we call la canestra, the basket in Italy. And he valued it highly. He will always look for a companion piece for this work, but in his diary, he writes that it shall forever remain solitary, for nothing can compare to its beauty. He was never able to find another still life which was just as beautiful. And indeed, if you go to the Ambrosiana today, you will find that it is still exhibited on its own. It dominates a particular wall on which it is hung. Now, Caravaggio was a Lombard painter from Milan, actually, it has been discovered. And he had studied in Milan, where the tradition for naturalism had always been very important, had always been very documented. And indeed, this is a very accurate 
and realistic representation of nature, yet it is remarkably different from that of his contemporaries. So, for example, Arcimboldo, which you see on the right-hand side now, had painted portrait heads composed entirely of fruit and vegetables. Fede Galizia and Ambrogio Figino, also Lombard painters, had also worked on the topic of still lives. And yet, this basket by Caravaggio is very different. The fruit is very ripe. It's ripe to the point of decay, if you look closely. It's not classically perfect. And in showing nature's imperfections and nature's transience, Caravaggio hits upon a new theme. He tackles a brand new theme. And this is an early work by Caravaggio. We are talking about the 1590s, the very early 1590s. So it's the beginning of his career. He is one of the assistants at this point in the Bottega, the workshop of Cesare d'Arpino, a Mannerist painter in the service of the Pope. And when Caravaggio arrives to this workshop, to this Bottega, he shocks his contemporaries. He shocks them with his very unconventional talk. He recommends, for example, that they stop looking at the greats of the antique world, that they stop looking at the great masters of the Quattrocento, that they stop glorifying the antique, essentially. And he says, all of these venerable examples are useless compared to what nature can teach. Nature is a sufficient master for anyone, he cries. So, of course, this was taboo at the time, but Caravaggio will go his own way. And of course, his often crude and realistic painterly expressions will infuriate part of the clergy, will fascinate others, until his very dramatic and at the same time very realistic vision of the world will influence generations of international painters all the way down to Rubens. But let's get back to the canvas in question. If you look carefully, you will see that it juts out delicately from the wooden table that it appears to be poised on. So as if it's sort of breaking that glass veil between fact and fiction, it creates a three-dimensionality, which is almost like a, a, a trompe l'oeil effect. So it breaks that screen between the painting and our very own earthly dimension. It protrudes from its frame. It's also devoid of any other context. We don't see any other figures or any other objects within this piece, just a, a, a yellow ochre colored wool, which in fact reminds me of a lot of kitchens and dining rooms of the 17th century, especially in certain Flemish and Spanish paintings of the time. So, because there's nothing else, we are, and because it's so realistic, we are forced to place this basket within our own world, within our own dimension. And the trompe effect, in fact, is so effective, was so effective that in the early days of the Ambrosiana, when the gallery had just opened, the canvas was exhibited upon a wooden table just leaning against the wall so it could actually melt within the wall. Now, the, the use of lighting, as you can see, is also very beautiful, very, very direct. We have this, this source of natural light, which, which comes from the exterior of the painting, yet it's very golden, very delicate. It allows us to meditate on each of these single pieces of fruit. And you can see there are very different kinds. But if you focus on the apple, you'll notice that there is a wormhole in that apple and that the figs are a bit too soft, that the leaves are crumpled. You can also see that there are some dew drops on some of the leaves. So it's a sign that the seasons and time 
acts upon it. So all of these particulars allude to another iconography in the history of art, which is called vanitas, the theme of vanitas, which in Latin means emptiness. And so it points to the inevitability of death, to the fluctuating days and hours of all that is natural and earthly. And this is a theme which will gain enormous popularity in the 17th century, in Flemish art, in Dutch art. And by the way, this is a brand of painting in which the Cardinal was one of the most sophisticated collectors. And if you visit the Ambrosiana, you will also see there is a room entirely dedicated to Flemish art. And yet, I think back to Lucretia's golden lock and how perfect a relic it still is and how the body may perish but the memory will last and how our memory is in fact an antidote for the inevitable decay of earthly life how the keepsake whatever it is whether it is a lock of hair or just a thought expressed could be the thing which vanquishes the vanitas and the Ambrosiana itself is a precious treasure chest of beautiful and curious keepsakes. And as we walk out of the building now on our own two metaphorical legs, we must remember that we are also walking, in fact, on sacred ancient ground. We are walking on the old Roman Forum for the Ambrosiana and all of the annexed buildings around it have sprouted from the ground which was once at the center of ancient Roman life with its temples, its tabernas, its porticos as you can see from the print and from the rendering there and that beneath the Ambrosiana as you can see from the photographs lay the remnants of that ancient Roman pavement and so just as Leonardo Leonardo's musician paints the invisible world and the book of hours strikes a repetitive rhythm, I am reminded of Italo Calvino, of Italo Calvino's statement about the invisible cities and how an invisible landscape always conditions a visible landscape. And when I visit the Ambrosiana, I often think about this path that is trodden continuously over and over again through the ages, and which I sincerely hope that you will have the opportunity of experiencing physically in the future. Now, there are in fact, this has been a focus on the Ambrosiana, but there are in fact many wondrous art collections in Milan to be discovered. And many of the most interesting art collections, in my opinion, in my mind, are those collections which still reside in their original locations. So the so-called Case Museo, which Milan is rich in, the house museums, like, for example, the Paul di Pizzoli. You can see an image of the Paul di Pizzoli in the center there, with this wonderful staircase just spiraling around a neo-baroque fountain. And the Paul di Pizzoli is in a, an 18th century palazzo where a very distinguished Milanese nobleman called Paul di Pizzoli put together a very eclectic and wonderful fusion between painting, glass, furniture, jewelry, interior decoration. And if you look on the bottom there, on the bottom right hand side, you can see that in the late 1920s, the industrialist family Necchi Campiglio housed their precious modern masterpieces in a wondrous art deco villa. I'm showing you two slides there, the one with the pool at the bottom and then directly above that, the interior. And this is an art deco villa in one of the most elegant neighborhoods in Milan called the Quadrilateral of Silence. And the Villa Necchi was also the, the first private home to own a swimming pool, which is in fact quite a surreal image within uh, the city of Milan. Now the interiors of the house 
still bear the original art, the, the original art deco furnishings created by this wonderful um, author, this wonderful architect and interior designer called Portaluppi. And this is the house, the Villa Necchi, where uh, Hemingway had often been a gracious, uh, a gracious guest. But speaking of the, the 20th century, and this is the last slide that I'm showing you, I promise. Speaking of the 20th century, let's not forget about the Museo del Novecento. You can see a slide, an image on the bottom left-hand corner there. It's a rationalist stone building from the 30s where the city's collection of Italian modern art is exhibited. And indeed, we are not just about Renaissance art. And it's one of its most wonderful features, as you can see, is this glass wall, this large glass succession of windows, which gives you the most spectacular view onto the Duomo, the Gothic cathedral. As you can see, you can just about make it out through the windows. Another fabulous venue just above there in the red slide is the Campari Gallery on the outskirts of the city, a collection of vintage posters from the 18th and 19th centuries, gadgets and tremendous works of design and art, which the Campari family had collected and promoted over the years, over the, dec over the centuries, since 1860, really, since they built the, the company. And of course, let's not forget that in our contemporary world, the great fashion designers like Armani, like Prada, have also built their artistic meccas in Milan, so exhibiting their collections, of course, but also their collections of contemporary art and patronizing, being patrons of contemporary architecture, which has, in some cases, completely uplifted and modified the, some of the areas, some of the more marginal areas in Milan, and such is the case of the Prada Foundation. And you can see that on the bottom right-hand corner there with this glittering but solemn golden tower. So you see, there is something for everyone. And Milan is this wonderful, eclectic mix of antique and modern, which embraces all periods uh, of Italian history and culture. And that, I'm afraid, is all from me today. You may be relieved, in fact. I have uh, been quite... Uh, been quite long I guess and I hope this was interesting for you and thank you so much for listening my thanks to to Tauk for organizing this for inviting me and I can't wait to start traveling with you again and in the meantime it's back to you Dustin I guess thank you so much Serena that was absolutely fantastic a lot of great comments coming in um, some questions, but we are way over. So, Serena, if you'd be so kind as to answer those after the fact, we will, get, we will get the questions and answers back out to all the guests that asked them um, in an email after the fact in a follow-up. Absolutely. So, thank you so much, Serena. We appreciate it. Thank you all out there, all of our guests, for joining today. We appreciate you as well. And um, look, look out for some more events coming up, and we will get you these follow-up questions uh, as soon as Serena can get to answering them. And uh, just thank you again. Bye all. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.